I want to welcome all of you uh, that are joining with me. Those of you that are watching still online, we're so thankful that you've connected with us. And those that are at the River Campus, look at your neighbor and say, I'm so ready to learn. Go ahead, tell them that. We're so ready to learn. Today, I want to remind you, I want you to write down a statement for me that I believe is a profound statement. It's a statement that every man, woman, boy, and girl needs to embrace in their life. And I want you to write it down. It's not in your outline, but I want to make sure that you get it. Are you ready? Say amen. Write this statement down. Eternity matters. Eternity matters. When we think about our life and the temporary position that we're living in, so many people have failed to realize how valuable eternity is. That is, we think about everything else under the sun, but very few people give serious consideration as to where they're going to spend eternity. Eternity matters, and your life matters. What you do with your life matters. When we think about living life today, there are so many things that we're dealing with in our world today, but your life should matter to you because eternity matters. You should matter. What happens in your life should matter. You should matter because you are not an accident. Can I get an amen? It's not an accident that you're, you're alive right now. It's not an accident that you're where you are right now. It's not an accident that you're sitting in this place right now. It's not an accident that you tuned in and watched this broadcast right now. I believe that the sovereign hand of God has been working in your life. Your life should matter because, are you listening? God loves you. God cares about you. You're not a waste. You're not an accident. You have a purpose. God has a plan for your life. Your life matters because other people love you and they care for you. Your life matters because this is not a dress rehearsal, ladies and gentlemen. Unfortunately, so many people have taken on the opinion that life stinks, that life doesn't matter. And because of this attitude, in this false conclusion, so many people are living a pointless life. That is, they're not cashing in on the value of their life. We're living in a world today that when you look at life, there's not a whole lot of value to it. I remember listening to Dr. Billy Graham, the late Dr. Billy Graham, just a few days ago. And as I listened to him preach one of his crusades, this is what the late Dr. Billy Graham said. He said the question, now remember, he was talking as he was preaching live in a crusade. And this is what he said. The question used to be, what is the truth about life? That's what Dr. Graham said. As he mounted that great pulpit in that crusade and looked at those thousands of people whose eyes were staring at him, the proclamation from the lips of that great evangelist said people used to ask the question, what is the truth about life? And then the late Dr. Billy Graham went on to say as he was preaching in that great crusade, but that question is not the question that is being asked today. He said at that crusade, the question that is being asked today is what is the point of life? Used to, people would say, what is the truth of life? And Dr. Graham said in his day when he was preaching the crusade that the question was what is the point of life? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to add a third question to that, and that is the question that I see that is moving in the hearts and minds of people all over the world today, not what is the truth of life, nor is it what is the point of life, but here's the question of the day, who cares about life? Who cares about life? We're living in a world today to where so many people do not put any value on life at all. People are at a place that they're going, who cares? What is this? It's pointless. Who really cares about life? As millions of lives are being destroyed, babies are being destroyed in the womb, murders at an epidemic rate like we've never seen before, suicide is at the highest that it's ever been before. In the year 2020 in which we now live, 132 Americans died every day this year by suicide. 132 Americans took their life every day in America in the year 2020. And ladies and gentlemen, we're not over 2020 yet. 1.4 million Americans attempted suicide. That is, I just don't want to live anymore. I want to throw, I want to cash in. I want to get out of this thing called life. 
Now, many times in the Bible, we are, when we read the Word of God, we're faced with the reality that the Bible poses many questions that we need to pay attention to. For example, in the book of Genesis, God asked Adam, where are you, Adam? Not that God lost Adam, but Adam lost God. God was interested in Adam's life. Adam, where are you? Maybe you're here today and you're listening to my voice. Maybe God is saying to you this morning, where are you concerning your life? What have you been doing with your life? God asked Adam that. Then God asked Cain, where is your brother Abel? Where is your brother Abel? And then Job asked the question, if a man die, will he live again? The Philippian jailer in the Word of God asked this question, what must I do to be saved? Pilate asked this question, what shall I do with this Jesus who is called Christ? The book of James poses this question, what is your life? And he goes on and says, well, I'll tell you what it is. It's a vapor. It appears for a moment, and then it goes away. The question at the final judgment will not be, where did you live? How much money did you make? How many friends did you have? No, ladies and gentlemen, not at all. The question will be, what did you do with my son, Jesus Christ? This brings me to my text this morning as we study under the the sermon title, A Serious Question to Consider. Say that with me, everybody. A Serious Question to Consider. I want you to open your Bible to the book of Mark. The book of Mark, when you open your Bible to the book of Mark, you're introduced to Jesus living his life on this earth. You'll see that in Mark chapter 8, the book of Mark chapter 8 tells us many stories about the life of Jesus as he lived on this earth. The book of Mark chapter 8 opens up with a miracle that Jesus did while he was on the earth. 4,000 people were hungry, and the disciples asked him, how are we going to feed all these people? And Jesus said, do you have any bread? And they said, yes, we've got seven loaves. Jesus said, break it and give it to them. And 4,000 people were miraculously saved in Mark chapter 8, the beginning of that chapter. Then you begin to look on down through there, and the disciples were there with Jesus, and the Pharisees begin to question Jesus, who is this Jesus? And the blind man in chapter 8 was healed. There we see the Word of God giving us the, the picture of a blind man calling out to Christ, and Christ begins to do a miraculous healing in his life in Mark chapter 8. And then Jesus, as we look at Mark chapter 8, he begins to teach the disciples and those that were with him. There was a group of people, a large group, that had gathered together to listen to this great teacher teach, this miracle worker that was sent from God. The people were curious that they wanted to get close to Christ and the disciples were there and the people were there and Jesus begins to pose and begin to press in a little bit more. He looks at his disciples and he says this question to them, who do men say that I am? The disciples begin to respond to that question, and they said, well, some say that you're John the Baptist. John the Baptist was murdered. He was beheaded. And some people say that you are the John the Baptist that has been resurrected from the dead. And then other people say that you're Isaiah. That's who you are. You're a prophet. You, uh, you, uh, you remind them of Isaiah. And then Jesus begins to push them a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And he says to Peter, but who do you say I am? Who, who do you say I am? The question that penetrates the very heart and the mind of the disciples. And, and the declaration was made. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The declaration was absolutely accurate and true. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Can I get an amen? And then Jesus begins to push a little more and push a little more as if he's speaking to you and I on this glorious Sunday morning as we assemble ourselves together. The very Spirit of God, the voice of God begins to push a little bit further. And then in John chapter or Mark chapter 8 and verse number 36, are you there? Let's read it together. For what shall it profit a man? Say it with me. Let's go back. Everybody read it out loud together. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Let's say it together again. And what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and what church? Lose his own soul. Now I want you to circle the word soul right there in that verse 36. 
When you study your Bible, you are introduced to that word, the word soul. Now that word in the Greek context literally means the psychic or, or the very reasoning aspect of who we are, the capacity and the ability to think and to reason. It's our psychic, and that's one use of that word. But then there's another use of it. It's called breath. That is, Jesus is saying here, what's it going to profit you if you gain the whole world and lose your breath? Now, I want you to think with me. Are you with me? Say amen. The, the word breath equates itself to eternity. That is what God is saying and what Jesus is saying here. What's it going to profit you if you gain everything this world has to offer and you lose the breath of eternity? What's it going to do? What good is it going to do? What good is it going to do you if you get everything this world has to offer, but when it comes time for you to pass from this walk of life to the other walk of life, when this world as you know it comes to a conclusion and you stand at the very threshold of the door of eternity, what is it going to profit you if you gain everything this world has to offer you and when you're about to step into eternity you lose your breath for eternity now that doesn't mean that if you don't know Christ you go into oblivion what it does mean is if you're going to go into eternity you need the breath of God to sustain you in that the very essence and the very presence of God in your life when you think about this, it's a profound thought. So what does Jesus do? Are you listening? Say amen. Jesus takes this moment to deliver to those that are there teaching moments. Now the very first thing I want you to look at point number one is this, a teaching moment about your life challenge. About your life challenge. Let's take our Bible. Are you listening? Say amen. Let's look there at this life challenge. Jesus incredibly, supernaturally, and powerfully, and convincingly says in verse number 34, And when he called the people unto him and his disciples also, he said unto them, would you read it out loud? Whosoever will come after me, let him do what, church? Deny himself and do what? Take up his cross and follow me. Now in this passage of scripture, in this life challenge that we see, there are four things I want to call to your attention in this verse. First of all, the challenge of direction. The challenge of direction. Notice there in the very beginning of that verse, he says, whosoever will come after me. Whosoever will, will come after me. Whosoever will, will what? Come after me. Circle that word, whosoever will. What a beautiful thought that is. Christ is saying that whosoever, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter where you come from, it doesn't matter how much money you've got in the bank, it doesn't matter what size the tracks that you were raised on whosoever will that is you and me and him and her and them and he gives a life challenge he says whosoever will will come after me my friend that is an absolute direction I don't care what anybody says I don't care what the modernists say and the liberals say and the religionists say every man woman boy and girl must make a personal definite conclusion decision you're either following Jesus Jesus or you're not following him. There is no middle ground. Can I get an amen? You can't say, well, I'll be following him today, but I want tomorrow. I believe that we're living in a day today to where every man, woman, boy, and girl is going to be faced, ladies and gentlemen. They're going to be forced with the reality that you've got to make a choice who you're going to follow from this point on. We're living in a world today that I believe rapidly approaching us that we're going to have to make a decision of our destination and direction, and that is you're either in or you're either out. You're either either for Christ or you're against Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, the day of neutral ground is soon to be over. I believe that we're living in a world today that the lights of Christianity will shine bright in a dark world, but don't make any mistake about it. I believe that we will be able to know without a shadow of doubt who's in and who's out. Can I get an amen? And the challenge is the direction for your life. Notice what he says. You've got to come after 
from me. Not a philosophy, not a, really, not, not a psychology, not a fable, not a fairy tale, not a fantasy hero. No, the challenge of your direction is absolutely Jesus. We've got too many people telling us, well, you can just decide who you, how you want to and who you want to follow. And, and by the way, all roads lead to God. Can I tell you that? That's a lie from the devil. Can I get an amen? People will say today, well, just choose your own way. You can just do whatever you want to do. It doesn't matter what religion you follow. It doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter about all that stuff. Just be a good person. Choose your own way. Choose your own destiny. Ladies and gentlemen, that is absolutely hogwash. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except he come by me. If you don't choose Jesus, you've made the wrong choice. Can I get an amen? Jesus said, whosoever will, let him come out after me. Just pick out, that's what people of the world today, just pick out whatever suits your fancy. And we, we're living in a world today to where friend people are saying, make your own choice. You better make sure you make the right one. Can I get an amen? Whosoever will come after me. And then I want you to notice, secondly, the challenge of denial. The challenge of denial. Notice what he says there. Whosoever will come after me, let him what? deny himself. Can I tell you this? We're living in a me world, ladies and gentlemen. Can I get an amen? It's all about me. What do I want? What, 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 what is my preference? What's going to make a benefit for me? We're living in a world today that it's all about me. Jesus says you must deny yourself. You've got to deny yourself. Have you done that? Have you come to that place in your life that you have made the right life challenge by choosing the right thing? Have you made the choice of denial? Now I want you to write down three things that's not in your outline, but write it down. You've got to deny your own strength. You've got to deny your own strength. You can't, you can't get to heaven by your own strength. You can't make it through life by your own strength. You've got to deny your own strength. Then secondly, write it down. You've got to deny your own sufficiency. There are people today who says, well, I don't need anybody. I can make it by myself. No, you can't. You need Christ in your life. And then you've got to deny, thirdly, sources. There are people that say, well, I'll just, I'll make the choice of this source or that source or this source or that source. Ladies and gentlemen, you have to deny your own strength. You've got to deny your own sufficiency. You've got to deny your own sources. There is only one answer to the question of life, and that answer is summed up in one name, and that name is Jesus Christ. No other thing will do. You've got to have a challenge of denial. And then notice the challenge of dedication. The challenge of dedication. He says, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and do what, church? Take up your cross. Whatever you must bear, you must bear. You're, dedi you're dedicated to the victory found in the cross. There is victory at the cross and victory in the cross. Thank God we have victory in Jesus. Can I get an amen? But listen, your dedication, you've got to be dedicated to the requirements that are found in the cross. You, listen, so many people are dedicated to the fact of the cross, but they're not dedicated to the requirements of the cross. The Bible says, take up your cross. That means on good days and bad days. That means in easy times and hard times. I don't know how many of you realize this, but Christianity is not an easy way of living. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's easy. Sometimes the sun is out. Sometimes the storm rolls in. Some days are good, some days are bad. But the reality is every day you've got to make a decision about dedicating yourself to the cause of Christ. There are so many people that are so wishy-washy today. They'll serve Jesus in the good times, but when the storm rolls in, will you still be dedicated? Will you still be committed? You've got to make a challenge of dedication and then the challenge of determination. Jesus said, whosoever will, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Are you following Christ today? Are you following Christ in your life? 
Are you following Christ in your decisions? Are you following Christ regardless of what this world is doing? Have you made your mind up in your life challenge? When you look at your life and you look at the challenges of life, have you made your decision that you're going to follow Christ irregardless of what the world may do? Though none go with me, I still will follow. You've got to make that choice individually. So do you have it? Say amen. Let's look at those four challenges. Say it out loud with me. What? The challenge of what? Direction. The challenge of Denial, the challenge of dedication and the challenge of determination. Have you done that? That is the only way to live your life. And that's what Jesus is saying. Whosoever will, let him take up his cross and follow me. My challenge for you today is that you will do exactly that. And then I want you to notice that Jesus uses this teaching moment to talk about your life value. Your life value. Notice what he says in Mark chapter 8 and verse number 35. For whosoever will save his life shall what, church? But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall what, church? Save it. Look, look at verse number 36 and say it out loud with me. Everybody, as we look there together, he says these words, For what shall it profit a man if he what? Gain the whole world and lose his soul. What's it going to profit you if you could possibly gain the whole world and lose your soul? What's it going to profit you? When I think about that, I think about the first thing I want you to write down, and that is unrealistic expectations. Unrealistic expectations. You know, when you think about what Jesus says, he says, what's it going to profit you if you get everything this world has to offer, but you lose your soul? What good is that going to do you? As a matter of fact, it's so unrealistic, it's almost, it's almost crazy that anybody would even consider it. The, the book of Ecclesiastes says this in chapter 1 and verse number 8. It says, all things are full of what? Come on now, y'all got to help me. All things are full of what? Labor. Man cannot, what's he saying? Work, 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 work. You're just going to work, work, work. Everybody's working. Everybody's working. Labor full of labor. I've got to do this. I've got to go there. I've got to work here. I can't go to church. I've got to work. I can't serve God. I'm too busy. i got this going on. i got that going on. You all right out there, my girl? You, she's all right. I got this going on. I got to labor here. I got, I'm busy. I got to work, work, work. And he says that we're all like that. And look, look what he says. The eye is not satisfied with what, church? Seeing, nor the ear is filled with hearing. In other words, you work, you work, you work. And, and no matter how hard you work, there's always going to be more stuff to see, and there's going to be more stuff to hear. There's always going to be something else. You cannot get all that the world has to offer you. People today say, well, I'm going to work, 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 and I'm just going to go see the world. I'm, I'm working so I can go see this and see that, see that. You know what? When you see something, there's always something else to see. Can I get an amen? You hear something, there's always something else to hear. And, and you know what? There's always going to be something else to see and something else to hear. And there's always, write this down, always going to be something else to do. Can I get an amen? Now, look, you ain't never going to get all that. You ain't never going to get all that. You're never going to see everything. You're never going to hear everything unless you're on Facebook. Some people on there think they know it all. I'm just kidding. That came out of nowhere. I'm sorry. The fact of the matter is, watch this. It doesn't matter how hard you try. It doesn't matter what you do. You can't get it all. Now, notice what he says in the book of Ecclesiastes. He says in chapter 5 and verse number 10, say it with me. He that loves silver shall not be satisfied with silver. In other words, I got to get some silver. I got to get me some silver. I'm going to get more silver. And he says, well, you're not going to be satisfied with it when you get it. And notice what else he says, nor he that loves abundance, you're not going to love everything you get because everything you get causes you to have to work some more. Can I give an amen? You say, well, I'm going to get this. I'm going to get that. I'm going to achieve that. I'm going to achieve that. And then all of a sudden you're thinking, well, if I get it, i got to work more. i got to get that. i got to have that. That caused me to work more, make me more silver so I can get some more stuff. And stuff, oh, my goodness, it's, a, it's just a cycle. And what is he saying? He's saying it's unrealistic. It's an unrealistic expectation, and it's an unrealistic profit. 
Now just take your Bible, flip over to one book toward the end, to the book of Luke. And look there what he says. It's unreal. You can't get it all. No matter how much you work, there's always going to be something else to do. No matter what you see, there's always going to be something else to see. No matter what you hear, there's always going to be something else to hear. And it doesn't matter how much you get, you can't have it all. And by the way, what if you could get it all? All right, now watch this. Luke, are y'all with me? Say amen. Luke chapter 12. Open your Bible up. Don't miss it. Open your Bible up to Luke chapter 12. Now, you know this story, and, and this is what it says. He spake a parable unto them, saying, the, the ground of a rich man brought forth plentiful. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to put my fruits? And he said, This is what I'm going to do. This, this is my plan of life. This is how I'm going to handle all my stuff. I'm going to pull down this barn, and I'm going to build another barn. And, and I tell you what I'm going to do. When I pull this barn and I, and I, and I build this other bar, barn, then I, I'm going to have plenty of place to put all my stuff and all my goods. And I'll say to myself, so thou hast good, much goods laid up for how long? Come on now, say it with me. For how long? In other words, watch this. I'm planning for retirement. I, I'm going to have all this stuff laid out here. And I'm going to take it easy, and I'm going to drink, and I'm going to have the time of my life. That's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to live my life for the stuff. That's what I'm going to do. And then the Bible says, read this with me, but God. How many of you understand those two little words in that verse, but God, it, it interrupts everything. Say it with me, but God. Not but the president. Not but the economy, not but my neighbor, not but my wife, but God said unto him, You fool, tonight your soul's going to be required of you. Then who's all this stuff going to be? Are y'all listening to me? Look at, look at Brother Jackie. He said that that morning. That morning. He said, you know what I'm going to do? I got plans. I'm going to live my life. I'm going to get my stuff. I'm going to put it all up. I'm going to, I'm, man, I'm going to have it made. I'm going to eat, drink, be merry. I mean, I got my 401ks planned. I got stuff. But watch this. But God. He said that that morning, and God said, hey, wait a minute. You know what you are? Watch this. Are you listening to me? Don't cut me off. Are you listening to me? Say amen. God said, you know what you are? You're a fool. Because tonight, you're going to die. Not, not tomorrow night, not next week, not next month, but tonight. When you lay your head down at night, you're going to die. And here's the profound question. Then who's all the stuff going to be? I tell you what's going to happen to all your junk. They're going to have a yard sale. They're going to fight over it. They're going to they're take it to the Hannah home. Brother Jack's going to go up and buy it at a half price. He's going to wear the tie you used to have. And you know what? All your, listen, are you listening to me say amen? No way, no how can you take anything with you. When it comes to the end of the journey, if you hadn't taken serious consideration about eternity, you won't have a Brinks truck following you. you. You won't have all that stuff to take with you. Watch this. It is unrealistic. How many people do I know that's wasting their life on unrealistic expectations? You can't have it all. You can't get it all. Even if you had it all, you wouldn't be happy. Even if you could get it all, you'd still be miserable. Even if you could acquire it all, there'd still be something. There is no way to do it. No way to do it. Are you with me? Then I want you to look at the third thing, and that is this. A teaching moment about your life exchange. About your life exchange. Now, y'all stay with me. Are you with me? Flip back over to Mark. Mark chapter 8, and I want you to notice in verse number 37. What shall a man, somebody help me, give in exchange for a soul? Now, are y'all, listen, 
Say it with me again. What shall a man give in exchange for a soul? Here's the thought of that. What would it take for you to sell your soul to the devil? What, what would it take for you to sell out your soul to the devil? What would a man give in exchange for a soul? Here, here's the question. Would you sell your soul for money? Would you give your soul for money? Would you sell out your soul if the devil could say to you, hey, I'll tell you what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to give you all the money in the world. Would you sell your soul for it? Would you sell your soul for pleasure? Would you say, well, the devil says, well, I'll give you pleasure. Would you sell out for pleasure? Would you sell out for sex? Would you sell out for drugs? Would you sell out for fame? Whatever you would sell your soul for, whatever you would exchange your soul for, watch this, write it down. It's a bad deal. Can I get an amen? Now, let's suppose for a moment that you had a diamond that was worth $5,000. And you were sporting that diamond around on your finger, and I were to walk up to you and I were to say, hey, that's, that's, quite, a, that's quite a rock you got on your finger. Uh, how much is that thing worth? You say, well, uh, Brother Jackie, uh, this thing is worth $5,000. And I would say, well, my goodness, that's quite an expensive rock you got. Listen, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you 100 bucks for it. And you say, deal. You know what you would be, watch this right, you'd be an idiot. You would sell me your diamond that's worth $5,000 for $100. Listen, that would be a bad deal. Or suppose you had some land. Let's just suppose that you had some land, and your land was worth $250,000. And uh, I came up to you, and I said, well, I hear you got some land for sale. And you say, yes, I do. I've got some land I'd like to sell. And I say, well, how much, how much is it worth? You say, well, Brother Jackie, this land that I've got is worth $250,000. And I were to look at you and say, I'll tell you what I'll do today. I'll give you 1000 bucks for it. And you would say, Deal. You know what I'd call you? Idiot. I would say, man, this person just sold out. Watch this. Watch this. He sold out cheap. He sold out cheap. But yet, how much more foolish it is that a man would sell his soul for the temporary things of this world, the pleasures of all oh, my friend, never forget, Satan stands ready moment by moment to make you that offer. He says, live your life for me, and I'll give you pleasure, and, 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 and I'll give you all the pleasure of this world, and at the end of this way, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll take you at the end of the way for you to live in hell for, with me forever. And, listen, I'll give you pleasure now, but hell later. I'll give you profit now, but hell later. Who in their right mind would sell their soul so cheaply a life that is filled with a few party pleasures and fleshly thrills, a life without real happiness or meaning, and at the end of that life, a cold, dark grave and an eternity in the flaming fires of hell. Esau sold his birthright for a, for a cup of soup. How much would you sell for? People everywhere are selling their birthright for the things of this world. What's it worth to you? What's it worth to you, young man, young woman? What's it worth to you? Can the devil buy your soul cheap? Could he give you all the things of this world in knowing that there's no way you can have it anyway, that it's unrealistic, it is absolutely impossible for you to gain it all? But yet, you're selling your soul for it. Now, there's a teaching moment about accountability also. Because the Bible tells us that there is a moment, watch this now, that you'll meet God. And you know what? Watch this. You'll meet God. In Mark chapter 8 and verse 38 it says, 
Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. And by the way, he is coming. Can I get an amen? Do you believe he's coming, church? He is coming. And there'll be a day that you'll have accountability. Well, let's think about it for a minute. One day we're all going to stand before God. And we're going to give an account of our lives. Are you listening to me? What will you offer him? What will you offer him? Will you say to God when you're faced with God, when you're there looking at him, he's looking at you, would you say, God, I'll tell you what I'll do. Let's make a bargain. I'll give you some money. That's what I'll do. God, here, listen, I'll give you money. That's what I'll do. That's, all, that's why I worked my whole life. I, I neglected you. I didn't go to church. I didn't serve you. didn't give my life. I was so busy making money. So I tell you what, God, at the end of the journey, now I've got to stand before you. Here's what, God, let's make a deal. I'll give you some money. Look at, the, look at me. God doesn't need your money. How many of you understand he owns it all? You say, well, now, wait a minute, God. Uh, I'll tell you what. Let's, let's, let's talk. Yeah, I'll tell you what, God. I'll, get, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you, I'll give you pleasure. That's what I live my life for. I just, I just live my life for pleasure. God, I'll, I'll give you pleasure. That's what I'll do. He doesn't need your pleasure. He's in heaven. Angels are singing for him. He has the beauty of heaven. What kind of pleasure could you offer him? You say, now, wait a minute, God, i tell you what I'll do. i tell you what I'll offer you, God. I'll give you some houses. Have a look at me. He don't need your house. He's been working 2,000 years building mansions. He doesn't need your money. He doesn't need your house. He doesn't need your pleasure. Watch this. God doesn't need anything you got. So if you're sitting there thinking, well, God, I'm going to waste my life on this. I'm going to waste my life on that. I'm going to work. I'm going to neglect you. I'm going to leave you out of my life. I'm going to make money. I'm going to buy houses. I'm going to buy cars. I'm going to buy stuff. I'm going to buy things. So at the end of my life, when I stand before you, you and I can make a deal. How many of you understand this? God is not going to make a deal with you. What will you offer him? When you die, you can't take nothing with you. The only thing that could be offered to God, are you listening to me? Say amen. The only thing that could be offered to God is a soul that is washed in the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. That's the only thing you give him. The only thing that I could possibly give in exchange for my soul is faith in Christ who died on a cross for my sins, a belief in his finished work, and the fact that I accepted Christ as my Savior. That's all I could give him. I couldn't give him anything else. There's nothing else that would suffice. When I thought about that, I thought about an old preacher years ago. His name was Dr. A.J. Gordon. Dr. Gordon was a pastor of a church in Boston many years ago. And one day he met a little boy out in front of his church. Dr. Gordon had, Gordon had finished preaching and uh, he was out in front of his church after everybody had gone. A little boy come by, met this little boy out in front of his church. And, and Dr. Gordon met this little boy, and this little boy was carrying a rusty bird cage with a few little old scrappy-looking birds in the cage. And uh, they were all fluttering around in the bottom of the cage as if they knew they were going to be destroyed. And Dr. Gordon said, Son, where'd you get those birds? And the boy replied, well, I trapped them out in that field right out there. Trapped those birds. What are you going to do with them, Dr. Gordon asked him. He said, well, I'm going to take them home, and I'm going to play with them and have some fun with them. And Dr. Gordon said, well, what are you going to do with them when you get through playing with them? He said, well, I'm going to give them that old cat that's around the house. I'll just feed them that old cat. They ain't no good anyway. Dr. Gordon said, now, son, 
How much would you take for that bird cage, them few old birds in that cage? He said, sir, you don't want these old birds. They can't even sing. They're, they're not canaries. They're just old field birds. Dr. Gordon said, I'll tell you what, boy. I'll give you $2 for that bird cage and them birds. The boy handed it to him and said, you made a bad deal. He said, I'll sell you them birds for $2. Here you can have this old rusty cage, too. And Dr. Gordon took that old rusty cage out in the back of his church and opened the door and let them little old birds fly away. And they flew out of that old rusty bird cage. And Dr. Gordon grabbed that bird cage up. And the next Sunday, he had one of them big old, big old wood pulpits. And he set that bird cage down. His congregation came. He told them a story. I found a little boy and bought these birds. And I took them out back and I let them go. And he said, you know what, folks? When them birds flew out of that cage, it was as if I could hear them sing, redeemed, redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. And he said, them birds flew out of that cage, and, and, and it was amazing. Uh, he said, they went soaring off into the blue, singing as they went. Redeemed, redeemed. Oh, my friend, can I tell you this? We're like those birds in that cage. Satan's got you in that old rusty bird cage of sin. He's got you, and you know what? You ain't worth nothing to him. Why, he ain't going to do nothing but play with you for a while, and then when it's all over, feed you to the old alley cat. The very imps of hell will destroy you. But oh, listen, there was a day when a Savior saw your predicament Knew you couldn't sing. Knew you wasn't a canary, but he said, I'll pay for them old birds. And he didn't pay for you with $2. He paid for you with his blood on a cross called Calvary. And that Savior, when you ask Jesus in your heart, that Savior unlocks that bird cage of sin. And he says to us old worthless birds, fly. And we can, we can release ourselves from that old cage singing, redeemed, redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus paid a price to set you free. The devil's been playing around with you for so long. He's tried to convince you that, that this life is all there is and you need to s sell yourself out, your soul out. But oh, my friend, listen. There is a fountain filled with blood, filled from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood shall lose all their guilty stains. All you got to do is come to him. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What will it cost for you to sell your soul to Satan today? In just a moment, I'm going to give an invitation all over this auditorium for those that are here and those that are watching online and those that are at the river campus. And I'm going to invite you to come down to the front of this church and say to these people, I've, I've given my life to Jesus. And the Bible says that if you're ashamed of him before men, he'll be ashamed of you before his Father in heaven. One day we'll stand before the great God of this universe and we'll give an account of our life and what we did with it. And there's going to be so many people that sold out too cheap. And their souls will be condemned to an eternity in hell. Here's the question. Are you ashamed to walk down the aisle of this church? Are you ashamed to come and say to this world and these people, I trust Jesus today. 
I don't trust in the fame and the fortune of this world, but I'm going to trust in Jesus. The Bible says, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory. My friend, don't put it off. He's coming. He's coming and he's filled with his glory. Don't wait another second, another moment. But come to Christ while you have time to trust him as your Savior. In just a moment, I'm going to invite you to stand. For those of you that want to trust Christ as your Savior, for those of you that want to join the church and be, become a productive member of a great Bible-teaching church, today is the day to do that. And I'm going to invite you unashamedly to walk down front. Yes, I'm going to call you to do that. And we're going to rejoice with you, and we're going to celebrate with you. But I don't want you to put it off another second. I'm going to invite every man, woman, boy, and girl to stand in the sound of my voice. And as we stand, ministers are going to come down here, and they're going to greet you, and they're going to meet you, and they're going to help you make your decision today. So today, as they come, let's sing together. As they come, join with us as we sing. Here's you come. On behalf of our pastor, thank you for joining us today. We would love to pray for you. So please submit your prayer request to EdenWestSide.org. Again, thanks for being with us, and don't forget to join us for tonight's message.